So welcome everyone. My name is Chase Osanya. I'm co-founder and CEO here at Gravity Sketch. Uh, we developed Gravity Sketch quite some time ago as we saw a, a clear need for better communication tools in 3D. Um, we're all thinking in 3D, so why not work in 3D uh, from the onset? So what Gravity Sketch is, uh, and our mission, I guess, is the most important thing here, is to give teams that design the power to communicate ideas spatially. And that can take shape in virtual reality, which is what we're going to focus today on. Um, but it can also take shape in, in other forms, as you can see. So the idea of creating in real time together in a spatial environment should lead to a far faster communication and transmission of ideas, especially loose wireframe sketches. Like they can tell so much on a piece of paper and they can tell even more in the 3D environment. But that's not just the only component of what we're building. We're also building landing pad, which is the cloud platform that brings it all together. And so you could work across different devices. Everyone could be networked and communicating together from the iPad to virtual reality to your desktop computer. And we'll talk a little bit more about this towards the end of the webinar and on the things that are to come. But let's talk a little bit about what we're building from a technology's perspective. We're building a real-time geometry engine, which is all of our subdivision, mesh, and nerve space geometry, all this happening at 90 frames per second. So immediately as you pull a trigger or as you put the pin to the computer screen or the, the, uh, the iPad screen, we're creating geometry in real time. And that's essentially a spline with a mesh attached to it. Um, we try to build this geometry engine as seamlessly as possible in the sense that it feels like sketching. It doesn't feel like you're doing three or four click operations. And that brings us to the next pillar, which is the intuitive UX. And, and then finally, the real-time collaboration is the portion that, we, that we're really focused on. Um, we're, we're really clear about what we want to build here. We don't want to build a CAD replacement. We want to honor the craft of sketching. And even further, we want to honor the visualization aspect of the design journey. So being able to concept and see an idea in clay gives you far more information than any sketch does. And so how do we bring those two worlds together in a digital format or digital medium that allows you to excel accelerate the design journey. So in Gravity Sketch, you can create in 3D from day one. Here's a, a rough loose sketch from, from Scott. And I, I chose this sketch because I really like how it blends line surfaces and even ergonomic constraints all in the same environment at a very early onset part of the design journey. And there is an image somewhere in the back. I don't think it was captured in this, in this particular screenshot here. But further, let's like talk a little bit about the workflow. So what we currently are looking at is we're thinking in 3D, then we're jumping to 2D to sketch out our ideas. And then we're jumping back and forth to kind of relate these ideas to each ourselves to make sure that we're confident about the, the, the design direction. Then we're jumping into CAD. This could be a CAD team, but that's going back and forth as well, trying to like really understand what's on paper and what's on the screen. And what's on the screen is really this big. So you're fighting to kind of get an idea. And so you're taking that to core scale clay model or full scale clay model to, to gain enough conviction and then scanning it back in and going into CAD. So this takes months, uh, weeks in some companies, um, and it could be days depending on, on what teams are, are working on it, how much energy is put into it. But the ideal workflow would be if we can think in 3D and work directly in 3D. And so you can see these time sinks that we have here in between the kind of back and forth journey with yourself and the back and forth journey with your with your team. And so what we're trying to build here is a circular journey where you can think and create in 3D from day one using Gravity Sketch. And so the next diagram you're here, you can see we're thinking in 3D, we're creating a loose sketch in 3D. And because all of the data is um, applicable to the CAD engine, you could just drag and drop that in and keep moving. And there's a couple of different workflows that you can use in Gravity Sketch to apply this type of workflow. Um, you could work freeform sketching, which you'll see a bit of today. You could sketch over package data. You can bring in an image and trace an image, or you can bring in rough CAD data from another software and then do a design review. Uh, so the geometry, we focus on NURBS and we convert NURBS to a quad-based mesh, which then you can subdivide. So you can work purely in NURBS, you can work purely in mesh, or you can work purely in sub-D or you can have a combination of, of all of them together. But all the data is transferable into the CAD package. So if you export as OBJ, FBX, IGES file, you can bring all that in and continue your design journey. 
to get involved with Gravity Sketch, it's really simple. We're going to focus a lot on VR today, but you can you can use our iPad application or you can buy yourself an Oculus Quest. The barrier to entry has never been lower to virtual reality. So everything works within the headset. You get pretty much the whole of the application. There's a couple of things that are missing, like shadows and things like this, which we can touch on later. But other than that, you have the full power of the creation suite right there at your fingertips for $300. And the application costs nothing on the store. Uh, we monetize through our enterprise deals. So I want to now welcome Scott to the stage and we can kind of get into some of the uh, some of the questions we have lined up to, to get this webinar going. Well, thanks, Shay. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, this is, um, so I just saw a question go by earlier about, you know, why did we decide to do this webinar? And um, honestly, the reason why is because uh, I really like Gravity Sketch and I everything I've sort of like really gravitated to that I think is important for the community to start to know about. I'm, I've throughout my career been, you know, sort of proactively sharing uh, with the community. And I think this is one of those things. And we're at, we're at a point where the tool is sophisticated enough now and fun to use. And, you know, the barrier to entry with a VR headset is, is not, you know, it's half the price of an iPad, for instance. So, you know, I, I think that was why. And I reached out to Shay and said, hey, I've been using Gravity Sketch. I really love it. If I can be of help. Um, and so we, over the summer, have been putting together this webinar um, to figure out how we can, you know, help accelerate and make people in our community, our industrial design and entertainment design and transportation and product, all those related design fields, where we always communicate things into a final 3D form factor, how can we start to accelerate that um, and show people the magic um, in effectively, you know, spatial modeling with stereo vision and parallax and that sort of thing. Um, and unfortunately today in a flat screen viewing environment, you're not gonna get the parallax shifting, um, but uh, I would say, Number one thing, even if you uh, don't go buy a headset, but you know somebody who has one or you just one at your, your company or your school, just put it on, open a gravity sketch model of which I'm gonna share a, a, quite a few today with the community um, and have a look. And once you do that, then you'll understand the power of stereo vision in VR. So um, that was kind of the quick summary of the why. So- um, Yeah, I, I wonder- You I wonder... also want me to add, Shay? Yeah, I just wanted to learn, learn about the, like, how, how did you find this? I know that we had reached out to you as, as soon as I saw you do, like, your your first thing that was like, I think that's Gravity Sketch. I pinged you in, on um, <laughs> on IG, and, and it was, you know, it was just crickets. And so I don't really know exactly how you discovered it. I mean, I know now that we've had a, a bit of a discussion about it, but I, I, I think that was really a, an important part is, like, how you found it and how, um, yeah, how, how, like, what did you expect well, going uh, into the software? I will say that the reason it was crickets is because I was working somewhere full time and was not allowed to say that I worked there. And I was not allowed to basically do any more social media or workshops or consulting right. or anything. So I was on complete uh, social media lockdown for the last three and a half years. And that's why I sort of disappeared from everywhere. Um, but in May, that changed. Um, and I'm sort of back to my doing books and workshops and, you know, things like that. Um, but I had just, I had seen uh, John Park and James Robbins using it, and um, they, they, you know, kept telling me, I was watching what they were doing, seeing some Instagram posts, and, you know, especially James Robbins is sort of like my mentor on sub-D modeling in VR, right? He's the right. one, you know, who helped me get into it um, in a sort of more finished level of uh, modeling, and uh, I just saw that he was having too much fun, right? <laughs> Yeah. What are you doing? You know, because he had he had an early collab room that he invited me into. So I had seen that actually quite a while ago. And I was like, what? What are you doing? And 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 the you know, the ability to place points in space, right? Very right. intuitively is is like hands down one of the coolest things ever. And so I was like, okay, I, I this is this really is the future of this sort of visualization. Um, and so I should I should learn this. And so it was really a desire to sort of stay relevant in regards to what are the new tools. I love creativity tools. I love researching those subjects and then doing a deep dive. And then I like to take them and sort of try to break them, the tools and figure out other ways to use them. And right. um, so that that sort of led into a deeper dive into Gravity Sketch. Um, but all the time, I'd say with, with James 
uh, mentoring me on, you know, bothering him about topology questions. So yeah, yeah. If, if those of you that don't know James Robbins, you could find him online. Um, his YouTube channel has um, helped a lot of people in their early stages of uh, development with uh, Gravity Sketch. He's an automotive yeah, he transportation designer. Yeah, yep. amazing guy. Super nice. Really active part of the community. Mm -hmm. I also want to ask when, like, uh, there's two. It's a two part question. So when was this? Because we, you know, you've been silent for quite some time. And yeah. How long? How long did it take until you felt competent to start sharing or even just start using this in pipeline? Um. I think uh, probably I have about, I don't know, I have a couple of years now in Gravity Sketch, maybe two and a half ish. Right. And, um, you know, it, it, it took me probably, you know, it took me only an afternoon to see the potential, but then it took me a, probably a couple of weeks to build the muscle memory of the buttons. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a new UI if you're, you know, coming from flat CAD keyboard and mouse environment or coming from a sketchpad pencil environment, um, you know, it lives somewhere in the middle of those. And so, um, you know, it took me a little while to get some muscle memory, but once I started getting some muscle memory, then once I had that, then I immediately started to create content, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's great. And, and so would you say like your onboarding was relatively like self, self-driven? I know that James helped you a lot in the, topology side of things but the biggest question we get from the community is like or or even customers it's like how long is it going to take us to to get oh, I, up to speed with this thing yeah i would say having having learned i don't know i've learned like 10 different programs in the last few years um gravity sketch was one was probably one of the easiest you know and, and in fact i would say that across the board that all the vr programs i've learned have been across the board the easiest ones <laughs> to learn um mm -hmm as compared to how much stuff and content is, is in something, even something like Photoshop is like, you can go so deep, right? But in something like Moto or Maya or those sorts of programs, they're excellent further downstream, um, mm. but they are very deep. And to turn them into a simplified tool that you use takes a long time to figure out, oh, I only need to know these things. Mm. Whereas you jump into Gravity Sketch and it has only those things, right? Mm. They're, it doesn't have all the deeper layers of like everything is, you know, one menu, two menus deep. And that right. and that's all there is. And so I yeah. love it for that because it's closer to, a, you know, a, a ballpoint pen and a piece of paper. Right. Um, and so in that regard, I think it's, it's simpler and faster to learn the architecture. That's like so awesome to hear because <laughs> when we started developing, what we wanted to focus on was uh, the first mile of the design journey. We always saw like these, these 3D programs are always focused on the the, the last mile, essentially. Mm. How do you get something to render or something to actually mill? But what about just getting something from the page or from the screen into 3D? And that's why we've curated the tool set in such a way. And, and we do want to eat away a little bit more and make more powerful tools. Like, don't get me wrong, but just giving like those key ingredients to be fluid, to be gestural, to be expressive in 3D is, is like, that's what we think the formula for, for success is. Yeah, um, I agree. And and I've I've noticed that we didn't really introduce you. <laughs> like we didn't really talk about your background, who you are. I, I don't know if there's people on the call who I'm just taking for granted that everyone knows who you are, but well, potentially there's people that don't know who you are. Yeah, we have sort of a short period of time, and I didn't really want to dwell on that stuff. So right. you know, I'm mean, it. You can go to my YouTube channel or just type my name in and find of my website or my Instagram is where the most sort of recent work shows up all the time. So. Um, Let's just find the info. Yeah, there. I, I've perfect. I've been at it for 30 years now. And so, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. I wanted to get into the gravity sketch part and show people the, the magic of, of, you know, of VR. Cool. So we're 15 minutes in. We have plenty of time to jump in to, to that portion now. I want to I want to frame the question that I've had going in my mind since we first talked. And you said something to me on our first call, which was that, the, that working and sketching in 3D improved your 2d sketching or it yeah. could improve the 2d journey and i really want to blow that up in this webinar i want i want to really discuss that i want to show how that how, how you see that and how you've been using that and utilizing that 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 process yeah it, it's 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 a bit of an abstract concept right that that uh working in a 3d program could help your 2d drawing um but i i have learned that even in moto right and doing flat screen cad work for many years that that still helped me to pre-visualize a three-dimensional model, 
right? So the more you look at a model tumbling in space, right? The easier it is to sort of call that back in your memory and be able to draw from that um, experience on a flat plane. Um, what I found in gravity sketch that was different was that when I, when I place points in space on a flat CAD program, I have to usually go to multiple views, right? So I'm usually looking like top view, side view, front view or rear and, and aligning those points in space because I really don't have any idea where they are. Um, if I'm in a three quarter perspective view, I can't just grab a point and move it with confidence that it's going somewhere uh, that I want it to go. Um, I have to pull back out to the draft views, right? Um, and do singular movements at one at a time and switch from screen to screen. And, you know, it's just super slow. And it's, and after a while it becomes really tedious, not very much fun. And so when I went and jumped into gravity sketch and I started drawing one, I found that it was like the most natural thing for me because thank you for setting up gravity sketch, which was built pretty much the same way I draw, which was, you know, X, Y, Z sections, um, and uh, working, and then with the magic of being able to just align your hands and con constrain your movements, X, Y, Z, um, that's what I do when I draw and I move points in space. I have to plot lines to move X, Y, Z, right? And I find those points, then I connect them with a curve in space. Well, in this case, I can move the X, Y, Z if I wanna constrain a motion of the vertex. And we'll talk about, and we'll demo that today about how you influence and modify lines that you've drawn. Um, with constraints, but also um, I could just now in VR with stereo vision and parallax shifting, I could actually just place that point from the beginning where I wanted it to go. And I would be pretty damn close to like where I wanted that point in space to be. And that for me was like, that's the big jump. So as you start to build those kinds of curves and you're getting automatic symmetry in space, you're training your brain to see these mirrored curves in space, right? And you will make a little mental jump and you will start to connect that back to the way that you draw. And you will have a better understanding effectively of the anatomy of a line. And that I think is the key, is that the anatomy of the lines that you draw in your wireframe effectively, which is your sketch, right? That is at the core of defining all of the proportions, you know, um, and the initial design, you know, spark or impression of an object. And so that, you know, the more effort you put into getting those things right at the beginning, the faster all the rest of it falls into place. Um, and so I found it was really about observing, building lines, appreciating the line a little bit more than I had um, that I definitely don't appreciate the line in a CAD, flat CAD program as much, but I, on paper, I do I appreciate the quality of the line, the gesture, the balance, the proportions, and then being able to take that same thing and appreciation for a line and its balance and proportion and thick to thin, all those things I can now do ineffectively, uh, you know, a beginner CAD program. That's pretty awesome. So I'm effectively seeing a thick to thin gestural drawing in 3D space. That is, that is new, that is different. That is not flat screen CAD work. And what you just, I went to the Royal College of Art um, and I studied uh, innovation design engineering. This was the thesis bet between me and my, my co-founder, but we would spend a lot of time with automotive. They were just um, one floor below us and they would do these little um, welded wireframe the cats uh, and mm -hmm. what you just said is like it's it's like reminiscent so much of of what we saw when they were making these little like spot welded maquette things they would yep. do this like in free form they wouldn't sketch they would just go down take a bit of wire and just start bending and spot welding it on the spot to get a, a loose structure that they then could sketch as a reference and what you just said like just clicked to me that that's exactly what they were doing was that form finding yeah, and I think if you have that knowledge about that type of drawing ability, right, of how to draw in perspective, basically, I mean, section drawing has been around for forever in perspective drawing. Um, and so if you already have that knowledge, it directly carries over super fast into gravity sketch. And so um, that's something you can be quite good at in the first day you're using gravity sketch, right, is um, drawing in, in space. And um, but if you don't have the knowledge of how to build with sections, it's going to be difficult. 
not, I won't say difficult, it's going to be harder. Like the learning curve is going to be a little steeper. It's going to take a little longer. Um, but if you already know how to define volumes and surfaces with lines, right, in space, then this is like a supernatural progression uh, to jump into this app. We should, we should go into the app on the back of this. Let's, um, let's go ahead and, and get started. We have uh, Emil in, in, uh, in the call and Nico, I believe, both on, on the Gravity Sketch side of things. Uh, some of them will be handling some questions in the comments and, uh, and, and another will be presenting the screen. So we will see Gravity Sketch in real time. I think Scott's also gonna jump into Gravity Sketch. Yep. So um, you guys keep filling us up with questions. I think Scott has a pretty clear path of what he's gonna break down for us. But as we said at the top of the meeting, for those of you who didn't join, we're collecting all the questions. Scott will be making a YouTube video on the back of this and he'll be posting on his YouTube channel. We'll post it on ours as well. And we will also have this recording out for everyone uh, quite shortly after, after we complete. And if there is appetite, if there's a lot of engagement on YouTube comments and the comments here, potentially we'll do another one. We'll just focus on some specific um, workflow um, tips and tricks that, that Scott has. Okay, so let me jump into the. And Scott, uh, you're using the Rift S, is that right? Tether? Yeah, I'm using it. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer questions and talk about headsets. I've, I've pretty much tried almost all of them. Um, but uh, yes, I have a Rift S. That's what I use as my primary headset. I prefer that um, because of the weight is lighter. Um, even though it's lower res than a Quest 2, um, I do prefer the. Uh, the feel of it. And in fact, my favorite headset was the original Rift, which is even lighter and more comfortable. So um, I love the original Rift. Yeah, super light. Yeah. yeah, it's so light, so comfortable. But you know, that that res was almost a little bit too, too low res to really appreciate what you were building. Um, so yeah, let me just double check. All that. So we got you up on full screen now. Um, Emil is driving guys. So Emil will be driving the view. We may be able to jump into Scott's view at, at some point, but we're going to focus um, I was looking at Scott at third person. We're using landing pad collab. I touched on this a little bit in the beginning of this webinar. Uh, we have some exciting news about this at the end of the webinar as well. Uh, but this is essentially a shared co-working space where they have all the access to the Gravity Sketch creation tools at the same time, and they could pass geometry back and forth and, and work in unison. Um, Emil, can you see my menu? When I pull this up, I'm holding it just in front of the side of the car. Perfect. Okay, cool. So um, let, let me just talk a little bit about uh, environment setup. Um, I usually almost always work in a seated position. Um, and the reason for this is that the hand skills that you have in uh, your sketching ability and line quality will carry over to the quality of your lines in Gravity Sketch. Um, I would say for sure they're easier because you can edit them and manipulate them after the fact. But still, um, there is a level of uh, handcrafted quality that comes through in a gravity sketch model. Um, and so in order to do that, I found whenever I stand that my, my head movement will drift relative to the controllers and I start the drifting causes me um, point placement problems. So when I want to start doing more precise things, I sit down. I almost entirely work with vertical locked because to do long sessions throughout the day, I found having vertical axis locked. And what I mean by that is that, right, if it's not locked, then the model will tumble. So I almost always have that locked. Um, of course, I have mirroring turned on almost all the time. You can, you've got a couple of different mirror settings. If you want to see the mirror surface ghosted or not, I usually just leave it off. Um, and then for workspace, I tend to use the custom and I tend to do the HDR on, but I use a gradient. And the reason for that is that I wanna set, I'm gonna turn on actually the stage floor here so we get a cast shadow on the ground plane, um, is that if I'm using the stage floor, which auto sizes to the model, um, I tend to go to a white floor so that it kind of looks like the reflection uh, hang on, let me just make this side body uh, reflective. Let's make it a little bit darker so we can see that working. So you see the underside of this looks like it's reflecting a white ground. So it's a way of sort of tricking your brain into thinking it's not really reflecting this stage floor ground where the shadow is. It's actually reflecting what's straight down 
um, in your HDR gradation. And that is actually white. So I sort of made that match. Um, that sort of tricks your brain a little bit. Um, okay, so I tend to do the three color. A lot of times, actually, I'll do a black horizon here, which is counterintuitive to setting up a natural world. But when I get in here and I start looking at the reflections that are created, the black line and the contrast shows up. So what you really want to try to do is you want to set up contrast in your gradation. If you're trying to do your final surfacing, you'll start to see all the plane changes quite visibly. Um, and it works well. The other trick I do sometimes if I just want to look at the reflective form is I'll grab the light and I'll flip it upside down and put it under the stage floor. And now I won't have the light trying to mix across the reflective surface. And so that's a way that I can start to see only the reflections. Um, and this, not, this model, by the way, is not one that I would say is tight by any means. Um, it's sort of a work in progress. I'll bring back the light. So right now the light doesn't have other controls other than position. Um, hopefully, Shay, someday we'll get some lighting controls on, you know, the soft. It's, on our, hit, of the it's on our hit list. Definitely and on our hit list. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and move this back to yellow now. And I don't have this yellow in this uh, color palette yet. No, I do. So I can just pick it, hit the color wheel, pick the yellow. This is your new clay shader, by the way. Shay, I like it quite a bit. It's nice, especially in rougher models. It makes the model look a lot better than it is. So. Um, all right, let's jump into the drawing component. So that's that's sort of my basic setup on environments. Um, I don't do a lot more than that, but I'd say that vertical lock is key if you have any sort of motion sickness. Um, for sure, leave that on. You'll be much better. Um, also, if you have, I find actually I get no motion sickness in Gravity Sketch as compared to like a gaming app. I'll get sick immediately. And the reason for that is that I control the camera, right? Right now, Emil is showing you the feed, but when you're in first person view, nothing moves in this scene unless I tell it to move. And so that actually keeps you locked to the world. Um, and then vertical staying vertical is also very helpful. But I find whenever you lose camera control is when you get sick and there are unexpected movements that happen, that's when you start to feel ill. Um, but in this case, um, only things move when I want them to. And that, it feels just rock solid. Okay, let's go to layers. I've activated these layers. I'm now gonna go backwards and let's turn off these layers. That's Neil's layer, leave that alone. Okay, so I think that when you move into um, any 3D modeling program. What I did there is I just moved the sketch over to the centerline plane and it auto snaps to the plane. Um, I imported it um, through using uh, reference images. You could import things. Let's just grab this one. There's a sketch. Okay. And right, I could have imported this one and see what I get close to the center line. It auto snaps. Okay. Kill that Sounds like there's a bit of desire to watch things from your perspective. Um, not sure how yeah, disruptive no. that's. Not sure how disruptive that's going to be if you wanted to share screen um, or, or Jaren, what your thoughts are. Yeah, but I'm on my PC. It's not going to. Uh, okay. And then the, the Zoom is through my Mac. So. Right. Okay. Um, either Emil well, can just kind of follow me around over my shoulder or. Um, I will be doing a YouTube video that I record on my machine that will be all in my first person view. So don't, don't be stressed out if you're missing these, these steps. I'm going to redo them all basically per the questions that you guys are writing right now. So um, let's turn this off for a moment. Let me just add a new layer. Okay. And what I, I tend to work from and see how loose the sketch is. I did this on my YouTube channel live and it was, you know, a five minute sketch or something. But that's enough actually um, to jump into Gravity Sketch. And you can also free sketch, of course, in Gravity Sketch with the ink tool. 
Um, I know this is one of uh, James's favorites, but I tend not to use it very much um, because I still like to you know, traditionally draw, but you can do whatever you want to do here. And you get auto symmetry, et cetera. All these lines you can edit, um, but I always find they have a few too many points for me. Um, and also, I think I'm faster in Gravity Sketch if I enter Gravity Sketch or any 3D program with intent, because I'm definitely going to do this stage within that sketch. But here's the thing I find. When I'm doing this sketch with traditional media, I can um, draw it very small. Okay? And when it's small, I can see the entire proportion of the shape all in one go. All right. If I come into Gravity Sketch and I try to do the same thing and I want to get far away from it so it's tiny, right? then I can't manipulate the curves because I can't see the points. I don't have the resolution to manipulate and modify the line drawing and see it tiny at the same time. But when I'm working on a piece of paper and I do a thumbnail sketch, it's much easier for me to see the entire volume and proportion of the object in one go. And I still have super high resolution, right? Because it's the real world and it's a nice pen on a piece of paper. And so I find that there's a very large advantage to working traditionally um, to plan your first steps in VR. And so here I've established a proportion. And now in this case, I don't know really anything else about this car. Um, but it has incredibly short overhangs, like no overhangs, and that's going to be a real challenge in 3D. So the way I usually start is I go to my pen tool. I use the point mode. I'm going to draw without end caps. I'm, I'm just really trying to emulate a, let's pick a brighter color. Um, I'm trying to emulate basically just a ballpoint pen final sketch. So the first thing I'll do is take you know, 15 or 20 minutes and just put in some points and draw the side view that we have. It's all we have so far. And I'm going to make these lines purposely a little bit thicker than normal. Uh, maybe the center line's out there somewhere. In fact, let's not put it out there. So you can see I can just grab a line and get rid of it. So my center line here. And I put as few lines as possible. A lot of times I just draw with these straight lines, like so. Okay, and then I know this is going to continue down here somewhere. Probably need a bit more overhang. I already know that in order to get any curvature in top view, I'm going to need some overhang. Put these guys in here. And Scott, right now you're just tracing that vehicle, aren't you? Yeah. With a mirror turned See, on. It's not a slow process, right? I mean, I can do a finished wireframe um, usually in about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and that's not just the side view, that's the entire 3D wireframe. So let's say that I've got that, I've got this, this design line here, like so. Got this one here. I'm not going to get into the specifics of you know how you end a line and stop. Those are the button controls for this demo. Um, a lot of that stuff, Emil and, and Jaron and team have done a really great set of tutorials on the YouTube channel that have these great little short um, tutorials to tell you how to do all that stuff. Um, let's see. Okay, so we're there. So I might do that first. Now the next step would be I get right into the package. So I like to blend, um, let's say the rough loose sketch, which came from traditional media. I've laid out some lines that I'm now gonna manipulate and pull them into 3D space. But I also like that when I pull those into 3D space, I want to have some real constraints. Like I don't wanna mess around and, and you know if I know I, it has to have four wheels, right? And uh, I'm gonna to have to deal with clearing uh, the wheel for the body side, it's like, well, just get the wheel in there from the beginning. I mean, I don't want to mess around and not address that from the, from the very start. So a lot of times I'll add some components. Let's make the reference a little transparent so we can see through. So I'll add some wheels. Um, you can use the tape measure. This is a very small car, by the way. So you can see here, it's only about just over 60 inches wide. Um, 
Hopefully that's still on the list, uh, Shay, is adjusting those, giving me all millimeters or all inches only. Yes, yes, you know, like a uh, document, document units. Yeah, yeah, just like, oh, cool. So we'll be able to change that from the beginning. So this uh, super short wheelbase of like, what, 84, 85 inches, um, super tiny little car. And now to make sure that that's correct, then I'm gonna bring the interior and let's just move this guy out of the way so we can see. Um, I have a pair of seats, which I have loaded as a prefab. Um, I have a person there, I've positioned them, I have a little mocked up steering wheel, a little mocked up IP, um, firewall through here, well, firewall's up there, but you know, I have a bulkhead through here and a dash, um, which was for this car specifically. But if I get rid of both of those things, this is what I would bring out of my prefab library. No sense in building it again. Um, you can then position, you can grab multiple objects together. And here you see I'm constraining just on the vertical axis, right, to change the position. Um, or if I line my controllers like this, I can move them forward and back, right? Uh, I can move them wider if I want to give a little more shoulder space between. So I'll usually do that actually right at the beginning, as soon as I've got the line drawing in there. Um, and you'll see in my line drawing, it actually has a little, you know, where the dash is, where the steering wheel is, where the seat is. So I try to follow that. It's, you know, it's all pretty much lining up. So this is, I think, the area that um, pays real dividends later. Um, when you're working and doing sub D models, you don't want to have to redo a whole bunch of surfaces because, you know, your package was wrong from the beginning. So I think the more time you spend in doing the setup, it's effectively just building the foundation, right? And so when you build the foundation, um, you know, it's just gonna all align and be simpler to deal with later. So I think it's time well spent. Okay, what about this thing? So what we'll do now is we will lock the reference layer and we're going to lock the wheels. And that means I can just go in here and use a big selection sphere and just grab the line drawing and move it off of the center line, okay? So I'll do that once again. I'm just gonna grab all this and I'm gonna move it. And then if I press my index finger on my dominant hand, it's gonna make a copy. So there I've now moved, kept my center line, moved out to the side, okay? Now what we can do is take any of the lines that are for the side only and delete them off the center line, all right? So pretty much all of these, Right, we only need that, we don't need this. Yeah, we could use that. Uh, we don't need any of this information. Don't really need any of that. Um, all the rest of this, this is for the, this carries over to the center line, that carries over. Okay, that's fine. Now, if you wanna get this more aligned on center, you can grab any line and then just move the point in space. And this is where you can now manipulate your lines and they will auto snap to the center line. And you'll see that that little red line pop up, I think Emil can see that, but I'm constraining this in only moving uh, in width off of the center line. So I'm basically snapping two, two curves right on top of each other. Okay, now we're gonna move out here into the side plane. I probably should have snapped that first and then copied it out because you can see it's all wiggly in top view right, because I was just quickly placing it on the center line. Um, no big deal, we're gonna move all these points anyway, so it doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is if we've constrained our side view now off of the reference plane and we wanna pull it into space. So I'll start with, uh, let's see, that's the center line, so that could go away, that could go away. Uh, I might still need that one out here. And let's see. Yeah, that, that works. Let's start with the window line. Um, so I'm gonna click it. Then I have these controls. I can see that it's mirrored. It's a round cross section. Um, you can make it a square or a diamond shape. You can change the size of it here if you wanna slide and change the size. I tend to work, I'm gonna keep these a little bit large, but I tend to work as small as possible um, because I like the precision. And so now what I'm gonna do, in fact, let me turn back on my interior so I can see where my people are at. 
So I see where that person's head is. And so I'll say, well, all of these are going to start to come over here. I want to do a big, I want to do a lot of tumble home, a lot of side window angle here. And so I start to manipulate these. But when I'm manipulating, manipulating them, you'll see I'm only moving them in one axis. And this is exactly the same way that I draw. And so this was, became super intuitive for me to work this way. And all I have to do is align my controllers and get that constraint line. It automatically pops up and I can just slide these. Now, the reason I do that is that I'm ensuring that the side view is what I wanted it to be. And the side view isn't gonna change at all, right? Because I haven't moved this line up or down. I've only moved it in and out. And that is just super intuitive. And as soon as you see that, so now I can move the vertical over here. Let's change the stroke size. All oh, these guys move over to there somewhere. That sort of thing. Um, you could pick these and I can, can't change stroke size all at once, but I don't really need them. I'm going to turn on the, the more finished one here in a minute. Okay, then what I do is I start going back to the center line. And let's maybe let's do these in a different color so that you'll see the width lines are added. Three points make a curve, two points are a straight line. Um, if you want tangency across the center line, you need to go here and pull this forward and look at it from the top. Let's see how fast that is because all I have to do is just move my head and look down, right? And now I'm able to get the tangency. And if I wanna get it tangent in the front, just edit and go to the front view. Right, and say, oh, it's a little bit too high here. I'm not going to be a nice tangency across the center line. And that's as fast as it is to align that. But I'm looking multiple views sort of simultaneously. Um, and it's, it's just awesome. And then let's pull this one over, at the base of the pillar, so maybe in here somewhere. Let's reduce the size a little. Let's pull these points over. I usually see I pull a group because I know they're all going to be sort of near each other. And then you can go here. And now we can go to the dead top view. It's a pretty active, um, your modeling is actually quite active. You're like moving your arms a lot. You're looking down, up, left, right. Um, but I don't have any trouble staying in it for a long time. I can, I can definitely do a six or seven hour day. Let's see, I'm going to base the pillar is here, so I move the red line over. Okay, and then this one's got to come out of here somewhere, and then maybe I'm going to put a little break, and then it's going to go like that. Maybe I'll have a similar line down below, so I'm just going to copy it and bring it forward. So maybe those are two key lines I want to experiment with there. Um, let's see. Let's See, more, I'm just trying to think how many more I want to do here before I turn on the full wireframe. Let's do a, one across the back. Turns out that's pretty straight. Um, now, if you now you I I will say I don't tend to start making a lot of changes at this point. What I try to do is um, prove out that the initial sketch has potential or was faulted. Um, we'll say I don't know if it's faulted. It just wasn't you know, as refined as I may like. And so what I tend to do is um, give the sketch a chance, basically. Um, see what you can find in it first that you like before you automatically start making changes to it. And the reason for that is that one of the ways to work fast in any um, 3D program is to be decisive. When you're not decisive, um, and you start to do lots of command Z because you're working in the computer and you can easily do a command Z, you can burn a whole day so easily um, and have nothing. So um, I think one of the best ways to work in, in any 3D or any computer application is actually to be decisive. Um, this wasn't very well done from the side view, so I'm just going to tweak that a little bit. Now you'll see there that I just did some very small movements and you held my controllers together. I got a vertical constraint. Again, so I'm only moving vertically, but you'll see the movements are very small, right? Um, up and down. And that starts to be the precision from years of drawing um, 2D that carries over into 3D wireframe drawing. Okay, now I'm gonna move this 
I'm probably going, you know, I'm going way too fast, but we don't have a lot of time today. I want to just be a, this is like an intro level, like what can the tool do kind of demo. Um, any questions? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. You answered a lot of them. I'm just kind of reading through the, through the chat now. It seems yeah, that okay. the, the next webinar we need to do your point of view. That's the that's one of the overarching. Uh, yeah, yeah. Overarching I mean, don't, yeah, don't don't worry about it. We for sure we will, um, and uh, not a problem. So don't don't worry if you're not seeing it from my point of view or not entirely getting it. I just want to give it. We wanted to give an overview of the way that you can use the tools, um, and really talk about drawing in VR space. Um, but this is a really fun experience to twist this and see a, see something um, in stereo vision. And effectively, this is like old school um, wireframe buck, buck building, right? That you would then later load clay onto, or you would um, bang aluminum uh, panels around and, and hit your section lines. Um, I will say that dropping a section line into this is super easy. We'll put a planar constraint on a line, I'm gonna snap it to my X, Y, Z grid and we'll come in here. There's a question I found really interesting here around the relationship to having fun in a tool um, and how that's connected to the final output. Yeah, so um, one, I think that this is super fun um, to do it in VR and it's new and it's fresh and it feels more interesting than the CAD flat, environment. And what I would say is that as a result, um, I've created things in VR that I don't think I would have ever modeled on a flat screen. And the reason for that is because just for me to do that um, without the surfaces existing in a flat CAD program, to my knowledge, actually doesn't, doesn't exist easily or as much fun as I just did. And now I can start to manipulate this um, and put a little you know, curvature through there. I can start to even play with the, the radius that's gonna be through here. Do you ever work with other perspectives than just the side view? Um, it depends on the object. So I would say I work with whatever's the, the most, um, the view that gives me the most knowledge about the object itself. Um, and so if it, in the case of a car, it's a side view. Um, in something else, it, it may be a top view, right? Or a front view if I'm working on front view graphics a lot. Um, but vehicle stuff tends to be side view is the most convenient. And the reason for that is, is twofold. One, one, we get a lot of information out of the, the side view. But two, um, it's faster to draw because you're basically just doing a draft view and you can indicate the perspective a little bit in one point. You just offset the wheels and a pillar and you know the seat backs, something like that. But um, so it's fast and efficient uh, to do views that communicate the most that you don't have to fully construct in perspective. And then of course, that sketch over there, the reference one, doesn't give me any information about the front um, graphics of this design. And that's where I'm actually just drawing all of this inside Gravity Sketch. And that's where it's um, turn off the planar constraint, where you can start to draw. Let's say I, I just start to indicate, well, would it be cool to have a, uh, um, a vent intake out here? And you need three points, by the way, to do a tight radius, two points to do a soft radius. And if you come back up and double click, it'll close the loop. So you might just start to play around with shapes floating in space. And then of course you can manipulate those and you can change the shapes. And I'm not even thinking about the surfaces in between. I'm just thinking about the overall graphics. It's like, well, yeah, I kind of want this intake somewhere out over here. And then I think it's gonna go back into there somewhere. So I'm gonna just grab it, I'm gonna scale it, I'm gonna copy it, All right? And so now I've just copied that one in there. Maybe it's brake cooling or something, who knows? And then if we want to get into surfacing, of course, then it's just as simple as go to a full curve, flatten it, full curve, and then select that one and select that one, and then done. Nice. So do you, the Scott, do you ever, do you ever um, just freestyle sketch without an image? I mean, this is kind of this freestyle mode, but do you ever start like that? Uh, yeah, sometimes. 
sometimes. But even then when I freestyle, I, it'll be on a separate layer and I'll use the ink tool and, and scruff around and find shapes. Um, I have a, a, a kind of an interesting way to do that that's a little bit different uh, when I'm doing freeform. And I'll show you a little like behind the scenes kind of thing. Okay, I just grabbed a shape that was um, grabbed from one of a rendering of mine. And it's like, it's a, think of it as a Photoshop custom brush. If you make them white on a transparent background and save them as a PNG, you can then um, bring them into Gravity Sketch and they will keep the transparency that you set up with the transparent background. Okay, so when I'm really freeforming and doing super abstract, I may not even be drawing anymore. I might be just using surfaces like so and putting a surface in space like that. Let's do something really simple. It's just a NURBS surface. Okay, now if it's a NURBS surface, I can apply a texture to it. And the texture I want to apply is this guy that I just brought in. And so I'm going to let's see, does it show up for me already? Yeah. Okay. So used to be you had to unlock it once you brought it in. Hit the color wheel. There it is. It shows up as a material. So now I've just applied that shape to this surface and it brings all the transparency with it. Now Neil's taking over my part. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to play around with. See, it doesn't, Unity doesn't like it when you cross over so much, but I can start to play around with this shape. All right. And then because it's white, you can, you can change the color of it in Gravity Sketch after the fact. If it's black, you can't make it lighter. You can, so I would advise making them white and then assigning a color after. But now I can start to take this and I can manipulate these points. I can twist this plane. All right, now I can start to double them up. And so we'll see, sometimes the view works, sometimes it doesn't. They cross, cross each other out a little bit in the way the Unity likes to render the transparency. Doesn't like transparency on top of transparency that much, but this is a way I've done some design work. And then what I do after this is if I stack up a bunch of these, then I combine it back with the lines. So now I go back here. And then I would start to pull, let's say I had a bunch of these. Oh, sorry, I'm still, it's still applying that texture. So I wanna, I wanna pick a uh, different a solid value here to draw with. Uh, now I can change its color, okay. And so I would come in here and then I would start to pull a more finished shape that was maybe inspired by the stamp or the Photoshop brush. It's like custom shapes in Photoshop, but it's custom shapes in Gravity Sketch. But you can take all your custom shapes out of Photoshop and bring them into Gravity Sketch. So the things you're used to doing in a 2D program, you can now start to do in 3D space. And then I won't use this later, this just goes away, but it helped me find some key lines here that I may not have had the muscle memory or the forethought um, to draw, but I made fun discoveries using this abstract method. That's a little more advanced than a little bit abstract, I know, not straight up sort of, you know, modeling in space. Um, what are we at on our time? We're already burned through our hour, we have five minutes to go. Um, you wanna do a little, any, any questions? Oh, I should turn on some surfacing. So uh, let's just, well, we can leave that section on, it's fine. Okay, so um, reference, let me just get rid of that for now. Interiors on, wheels are on. I usually bring in a standing person as well for one-to-one -one scale. That helps me get a feel for really how small is this object relative. I always like to do everything in human scale. I think human scale is, is definitely the way to work um, and relating anything you're building, whether it's an environment, a piece of furniture, a vehicle in this case, um, consumer product, anything. You have hands here, you've got a full figure. This figure is fully posable. 
right? So first you're gonna see that and you can say, that's not fully posable. I'm only doing these big gross movements. Well, you have to right click your uh, joystick and now I can get individual joint control, right? Um, and I can start to manipulate all of those positions independently. Okay. So that's something I usually always have as a standing figure or seated, whatever is appropriate. These are just some little mirror shapes. I put these hoops on this. I don't know why. I was trying to do a car that was actually good for, you know, it's a bit like a shoe, a bit like a product, a bit like a car. So I was doing some more mechanical bits and pieces. Those are little sub D shapes. Here's all the body surfaces. Um, not all of them, some of them. Um, here's the glass. And I'll let's leave it a little transparent. It's very nice in Gravity Sketch. You can play with transparency and opacity. Here's the doors with cut lines. Somehow and this Scott, do you want to do you want to highlight a little bit about where this goes after this? Like, where, where are we going after you finish your Gravity Sketch model? Um, what's the next link in your pipeline? Um, for me, it is um, usually uh, export as an OBJ. So let, let me just turn off that line drawing because now it's 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 changed quite a bit. Um, I will say that okay. So if we're talking broad pipeline, the next thing I would do if if this is what I like to turn off my line drawing, it will export whatever you see in the scene. Okay, so you can still keep your layers here. This line drawing can still be here. I've just hidden it. It's not going to export um, unless it's turned on. So my next step, aside from just saving it, which is the little floppy there, you hit the export button. And right now I've just been using the standard OBJ export um, with all the defaults set. So I export it here. You can save it to the cloud, to your landing pad, or I could save it on my local drive, like so. Um, I export that as an OBJ. Um, and then I open it. For me, I use Moto a lot, but you could put it into any sub-D modeling program. You'll get a control mesh. I think there is a way you were telling me, Shay, that you can. Yeah, so in the settings, you can options. go. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in advanced options, you can do the yeah. control mesh. Yeah. So the default is set to control, which means this is going to be faceted. I should show what that looks like. So if I grab this mesh, right now it's full sub D, the highest resolution. Lower resolution is here, but here it is off. And so you'll see in the low poly mode. And I should say I do almost all my modeling in the low poly mode. And I only do the final surface adjustments in the high sub D mode. Um, one, it's hard on the compute um, to work in sub D mode. Also, I find it very um, difficult to connect points in space with the curved organic looking mesh always updating. I'd like to see like really rock solid placement of points. Um, and to check it in the final, you just grab it to edit and then you click that on and off. Now, one of the superpowers of sub D modeling or VR, I should say, um, is scale. So if I want to work on a corner somewhere, right, I can zoom all the way into that corner. So Emil will have to zoom in with me. But you can see that, you know, now I could start to just manipulate the really small movements of a surface, right? And oh, you know, yeah, that one's a little too low relative to this one, right? And I'm moving them with confidence in space right, without having to go to a top view or a side view or a front view to manipulate and move those points. Oh, this little hollow through here, let's make that a little, let's make this radius a little bit tighter. So I just move those a little bit closer. And if we zoom out, you see what I was working on. I'm only working on this, this tiny corner, but it's so easy to do. It's so easy to get in there and control the radius and the curvature across the surface. Um, you'll see I'm even doing my cut lines in Moto as well. So there, there, all you do is you make a traditional edge loop and you delete the surface and now you have a gap. Controlling the radiuses all through here. So you can see it all, this is in its highest sub D mode. Um, and this is not a, a car that I would say is done by any means. I'd say this is, you know, the end of one, let's call it a day and a half of work to go from the line sketch to the 3D wireframe to the surfaces. I can definitely do the line drawing and the base surfaces of all the panels within one day. And then I can, it's gonna take, you know, 70% of your time to finish the last 30% of the details. So, um, which is typical of doing finished work. 
Um, but anyway, to wrap up, I go into Moto, I assign the shaders, uh, the material in Moto, and then I usually go export that into Octane, and I do my fast renderings in Mach Octane because I can do GPU rendering and it's, you know, it's my preferred rendering program. But I can set up all my, my scene setup happens in Moto. Um, all I need to do here is the polygroup um, assignments. And a lot of times every panel will just be a different color um, so that I know that they're separated because when they come into Moto, it will remember all my polygroup assignments for the materials, which makes it really easy for me to select um, the mesh component pieces if they're all matching in color. All right, I think I've, I've already gone over, but um, <laughs> yeah, to see if there's so, any immediate questions. Yeah, I want to. I want to. Um, there's 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 a few questions, but I just wanted to reiterate that we're capturing all the questions in this webinar, and then yeah. Scott's going to make a YouTube video that's much more tutorial style. I know that a lot of you guys in the chat have been asking for more like of a tutorial like kind of experience. Um, Scott will be doing that and posting it on his YouTube and our YouTube channels respectively. What I would say is that we we probably want to wrap up. I know a lot of you all have have meetings to jump into or the next part of your day to start. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna thank Scott for his time, and we're gonna come back to you guys. It seems like there's a lot of interest in maybe even a webinar just on surfacing potentially. So yeah. I, I will say, you know, Shay, on that front to everyone that you know, um, I, I will do it. I will will do either do another webinar or I'll, I'll definitely record a video to my YouTube that address a lot of your questions. But a lot of the things at the base level of how to use Gravity Sketch are already online, right? I mean, the tutorials yeah. are really nice inside here. Um, I can go here and there's just at the very bottom where the little graduation hat is. Look at all these tutorials. There's tons yeah. of tutorials in here um, on skills, exercises, workflows, all that sort of thing. So I would say go do those first. Um, that's what I did. I did all of those tutorials first to learn on my own. Then I went to James with questions, um, you know, because I didn't want to ask him things that are basically already there for me, even within the app, it's already there. And then James has a great YouTube channel. Um, and of course, I will answer questions to get, get you guys going more in this. But overall, I just like to say that it is a bit transformative and super fun. And be careful, it's a little bit addictive to start building models this way. Um, <laughs> and uh, just be forewarned that it, it has become, modeling becomes a really joyful process. And you will make lots and lots of discoveries by starting to see your surfaces and visualizing your shapes this way, not to mention the fact you can go into something one-to-one -one scale, right? And check your sight lines, um, all that sort of thing. Won't work from my view, but Emil can go in there now. I just wanna ask one final question. This is a question I always ask, and that is, do you have any just broad, I guess, broad advice, Scott, for designers, young designers, students out there, um, you know, wanting to be, uh, professional in the industry, um, you know, whether it's automotive design, industrial design, concept art, is there any, I guess, nugget of wisdom that you'd like to give? Well, I don't know if it's a nugget, but well, um, I think, I think when in the learning process, do not put, try not to, you always will, but try not to put undue constraints on the quality of the thing you're creating while also trying to learn a new tool set. So what I mean is be a little kind to yourself. And when you pick up Gravity Sketch and first use it, or you first use any program for that matter, or you're working in the shop, you're working with clay, you're learning how to draw traditionally, anytime you're learning any new skill set, cut yourself a little slack, right? It is new, it's going to take time. And the worst thing, one of the worst things you can do is put undue constraints on the quality expectation while at the same time trying to learn how to use the tools, right? And so I would say be patient, but determined um, and sort of allow yourself the time and space to fail and learn um, before expecting mastery of any skill set. Uh, yeah, great, great piece of advice. <laughs> well, thank yeah, you, awesome. Scott. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks everyone as well. I just want to touch on the community aspect. Thank you guys so much. We we honestly 
couldn't do and wouldn't do what we're doing right now if it wasn't for you guys um, who have joined like many years ago and Scott was one of them where we're just kind of finding our way in this space and have a very ambitious goal of, of helping to bring a more fluid design experience um, to the to that first mile as I mentioned of the design journey. A couple of really cool updates coming up for us. We, we will be launching this collaboration uh, or collab experience that you're seeing right now for free to all free users. Um, it's, it's a little bit different from the business version, but you will have these core features that you're seeing right now, um, Scott and Emil uh, exploring. So you'll be able to, to join your colleagues or your students or uh, present your work to, to your peers within the, the virtual rally environment. And that should be coming before the year's up. So, so stay tuned to that. And uh, a few more updates to the, to the software as, as usual, bringing some pretty powerful new tools on, on the horizon. Uh, just to mention again, we've collected all the questions from Scott today or that have been asked to Scott today. And, and we're gonna give those to Scott. He's gonna make a video in first person view. So POV as everyone's asking. Um, around how he gets started in Gravity Sketch and his his pipeline, his journey, and some of the tips and tricks that he's found. And um, I know you wanted to turn that around relatively quick, Scott, so we should be- Yeah, I, I should. I'm, I'm trying to do it this week. Uh, awesome. Maybe by end, by end of weekend, I should be able to get it posted up. So I think we're I gonna, still have enough of a gap. So. Fantastic. And we're going we're gonna to liaison with the community and everyone that's attending here via the, the email signup that you guys made. So everyone that's on who has signed up for this, we'll receive an email, a follow-up email with some of Scott's models. We have some amazing models that he's given us, the native Gravity Sketch models. If you do want them in OBJ or FBX file format, if you don't have Gravity Sketch, we can provide that as well. And um, and then you, you'd be able to kind of explore those and see those for yourself. Yeah, that's how I learned from James that all about the topology is he shared a really tight model with me that he had done uh, of one of my designs, we collaborated. And then I could study the topology. And I was like, oh, I don't have enough resolution there to make that curve, right? Or I have too many edges here and it's causing a little kink in this nice smooth surface, right? So right. it's all really about controlling that. And I think looking at the topology is very helpful. Um, and so that's, you know, the OBJ, FBX, I don't know if they'll preserve, they should preserve the quads, I think. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. quads will come through. Yeah, Quads will be preserved, uh, which is cool. Yeah. Um, Scott, that yellow car, I'm giving that away. I'm giving away another car that's even tighter just to show a really tight car, uh, a motorcycle and two boats. So there should be five models eventually, probably by the end of the week. Yeah. And these are so amazing. Got, I've seen them. They're so cool. Sorry, Jaren. Yeah. I just want to mention, we got those two boats and the motorcycle in the uh, gallery. If you all want to go ahead and check those out, if you have gravity sketch, um, you can go check them out now. Yeah. Okay. The, cool. I will say the two boats are very fast and almost entirely nerves. They're going to play really well on a Quest Two because they're super light models, but they're very rough. I have there's only a couple of sub D panels in there. The motorcycle is the opposite. The motorcycle is like pretty tight, um, but lots of lots of um, sub D, lots of quads. So mm -hmm. that's going to lag a little unless you link it to your PC, or if you're already in a Rift, you'll be fine. Cool. Well, yeah, those models. So those there's a few models that are available right now for you guys. We're going to be adding more. Um, Scott, is there any updates on your side? Um, just as we're closing it up, like, what what are you doing personally? Um, you know, anything, um, anything you want to share with the well, personally right me? now? I'm I'm I guess I'm technically unemployed, which is why we're doing this webinar. One of the reasons <laughs> right now, um, which is awesome, and I'm enjoying it, taking some time off. Um, but I still have a bunch of projects going, so I'm starting to ramp back up on new books, but primarily over the summer, I've been doing a vehicle with uh, Crypto Motors. So we've been working on a digital uh, NFT car asset. And so we're almost done with that, actually. Um, I built the whole thing in Gravity Sketch. We will promote and show the case study of that entire project. Um, and uh, But that's gonna be probably coming in the next, um, 45 days, I think we're, we're just, we're getting into animation now and final presentation of it, but we're, we're at the sort of color and graphics part. The model's frozen and done. So that'll be fun and interesting to do um, and see how people use that in the metaverse. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone on the call. Thank you, especially Scott for this time. You've given us far more than we've requested from you. Uh, good 45 minutes over. And, uh, and Jaren, thanks again for, for hosting that Q and A session. 
um yeah we're looking forward to, to syncing again scott we should definitely do this again i think that the yeah super fun it just like flew by because once i get rambling it's just like blah you know? <laughs> yeah it's like when i get on a development call with you guys right then it's just like yeah flood you guys with tons of feature requests etc but you guys have been amazing to work with i will say and super responsive and adding those snapping features and all that it's just it's, the tool is getting better and better um you know, and in all transparency, Shay isn't paying me to say this. I'm only offered up my time because I really love the tool um, and I want to help um, advance advance the creativity of our community. And so that's that's the, you know, the motivation behind our collaboration. Absolutely. And and then for us as well, like we we're offering this tool for free and we, we charge organizations. That's how we make money. The idea is that you guys can use this and fold into the pipeline and how you work and, you know, find new pathways and design. Um, myself as as a former designer, I know how painful it is to push and pull vertices behind uh, four windows in the CAD software. It's 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 not the, it's not fun at all. I almost can't do it anymore. I start yeah. to try to move it in space in the perspective view, and it's like, what? Where did it go? You know, and then I right. like, go to this view, and then that view, and then and then I'm but then I'm bored, and I'm like, I'm not going to stick with it, and so I'm not getting the same modeling results. Uh, definitely, the Gravity Sketch models are better then I can model on a flat screen. Uh, they have mm -hmm. gesture and character and some handcrafted look to them that right. I, I, I just can't get the other way. So. Right. Well, please keep giving us in, in, insight and, and feature requests, right. Scott, and, and same to the community. This is the only way to make the product better. At, at this stage, we, we really do rely on your guys' feedback and, and use of the tool. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you one last time and thank everyone. It's been an amazing session, super eye-opening for me. I know we had a, several calls, but I learned a lot of new things in this call. Um, yeah, so thanks, thanks a lot. And general, I just saw yeah. a couple, couple. One last question that was good. Oh you guys yeah, have sure. Discord, good. right? We do have a Discord. Yeah, we there do have a Discord. So, it's been posted a few times. It is on our website at the very bottom of the website. You just scroll down, gravitysketch.com. You'll find our Discord. Please join there. The, so. the Discord is unique because you talk directly to myself, our CTO, and majority of our engineers and designers. So you talk to the people that are building the product. Yep. Yep. So that's the way to communicate as an audience, um, you know, and help influence the tools. Yeah. And go follow Scott on Instagram. He, he, like he's probably the best Instagram page we follow right now. So <laughs> thank you. Cool. I, I did. I paid him a dollar for that. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, take care, right. everyone. Um, we'll see you everybody. Again. Thanks, again for, soon. thanks for joining us. Right. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.